Let's talk about performance. The private equity asset class is uh, notoriously opaque when it comes to divulging information about the performance of investments and funds. Um, the companies held are unlisted companies, so there's no market reference price for the value of their equity. And so the two issues are whether it's possible to estimate the value of a private portfolio easily, and secondly, with whom this information is actually shared. At the end of the day, uh, only the fund manager knows the value of the portfolio, and this value is only really confirmed at the time of exit. So information on performance is hard to get, and even more so in the less developed emerging markets. Private active performance statistics should always be analysed with some scepticism because they are extremely unreliable and inconclusive. If we look at detailed charts of private equity performance, the numbers are frequently all over the place and you cannot possibly draw any real conclusion about the asset class over the long term from just looking at a snapshot or a batch of numbers from any single specific period or any specific region or any specific type of class of investment. Let's see if we can make better sense of the issue of private equity performance, giving it some more thought. Let's start by examining the metrics most commonly used in measuring private equity performance. These are internal rate of return, IRR, cash multiple or money multiple, distributions to total value, DVTV, residual value to total value, RVTV. They may have slightly different terminology and acronyms depending on the jurisdiction, but these are the main four. IRR measures the return of an investment's cash flows based upon a financial function you can find in Excel. Cash multiple is simply the amount of money I get from uh, the investment when I sell it divided by what I pay for it. That's simple. DVTV is the amount of money my fund has given back to LPs divided by the total value. And RVTV is the estimated value of what is left in the fund divided by the total value. And total value is what's been given back plus what's left. DVTV is simple because it's cash. RVTV is actually the one that requires an estimate of the portfolio and is problematic. IRR has been criticized as a reliable measure by some academics because of the way it's calculated technically which has the effect of amplifying positive investments upwards and amplifying negative investments downwards. Nevertheless, used in combination with other measures, it is still the mo most widely used metric in the industry. One last uh, technical distinction we need to make is net IRR, the return received by the LPs after the fund manager's fees are deducted, and gross IRR, which is the return of the portfolio before the fees are deducted. It's important that the uh, performance of the private equity asset class be established. After all, any asset class can only really justify its existence if it produces acceptable returns according to its risk level. So let's review the evidence we have so far for the overall private equity asset class. Let's look at some well-known academic studies which have been made. The studies compared the performance of private equity to listed shares which are an obvious or perhaps only comparison metric, even though the profiles of the companies may not be the same. But that's as good as we've got. It should be noted that the private equity industry will of course want to um, promote the asset class. There's a vested interest there. The main reasons put forward for the private equity asset class being an attractive one are that the top performers provide long-term outperformance over mainstream assets, that's one. And the average performance is pretty decent as well, comparable to the stock market or a little bit better. So let's look at the studies. In 2005, academics Kaplan and Shoah analyzed the basket of 746 funds and found that private equity performance was 4% to 26% below the stock market equivalent, depending on the statistical method they used. In 2008, Boston Consulting Group, together with uh, Spanish business school ESE, found that their sample of private equity investments returned 13% compared to the 10% of their quoted benchmark. In 2009, academics Filippo and Gottschalk 
found that their private equity sample underperformed the reference index by 3% to 6%. In 2011, academics uh, Robinson and Sensoy found that their sample did better than the index by 15%. So we have two studies saying that private equity is worth it and two studies saying it's not. So it's inconclusive and for now the debate is really still on and academics will continue to debate this question. Let's try to get some more insight by looking more deeply at one example. Let's take an example of pri European private equity returns at the end of 2013. And what this does, it shows that we can see the dispersion of returns among the asset classes. In 2013, European private equity returned just over 9%. But if we looked at the quartiles, we can see that the top quartile fund managers delivered a return of about 20%, and the bottom quartile of fund managers delivered a return of around minus 9%. So in this particular example, the difference between the top and the bottom is a staggering 30%. And this example helps us to identify one of the key features of private equity performance, which is the wide range between the top and bottom quartile of fund managers. In the case of other asset classes like quoted blue chips, the equivalent range might be only 5% or even less. Many LPs use a method to assess their private equity portfolio known as the public market equivalent or PME. The academic studies we saw I mentioned earlier also use this method so it's worth knowing what it is and how it works. And bear in mind that private equity as an asset class is based upon absolute returns rather than returns related to an index. A dollar goes in and some money comes out when I sell, that's more like an absolute return. In this sense, PME is something of an artificial construct. It works by comparing a private equity investment to a comparable quoted company. So let's say that on day zero, when I make my private equity investment of say 5 million, I check the share price of a comparable quoted company and this is four euros. The day I sell my investment for say 12 million, I look up the share price which is now six euros. Now I can do the numbers. My private equity investment was up 12 divided by five which is 2.4 times. My reference share price was up six divided by four which is one and a half times. So my private equity investment can now be compared dividing 2.4 by 1.5, which gives me 1.6. So the private equity investment outperformed by 60%. And this is, in essence, the PME method used by LPs and academics. Uh, of course, in practice, it's a lot more sophisticated and lots of statistical adjustments have to be made, but that's the essence of it. Now let's turn to another uh, method of, ana of analysis of performance. This is value attribution analysis, VAA, which is also about analyzing private equity performance, but from a more in-depth point of view. VAA looks at an individual investment and tries to break down how the value has been created in order to get better insight into the portfolio. Value could be created by deal skill. I buy the company at a low price and resell it higher. Value can be created by taking the company and helping it to grow and develop. Value can be created for equity holders by leveraging the company, funding its growth through debt, instead of me putting my hand in my pocket and putting in some more equity. Most investments value creation is going to be a combination of all these three factors that I've just mentioned. And what VAA does is that it allows us to see how these different factors weighed in to create overall value in the investment. This can allow me, for example, then to assess the skill of the management team. Is the fund manager a skillful deal maker or a company builder? That's often a question asked in the endless debate about what skills a private equity fund manager needs in order to do his job. So what can we conclude from the studies made statistics available and methodologies used? Well, a few things. First, private equity as an asset class has on average generated a return somewhere between 9 and 12%. Second, emerging markets private equity returns have been more or less the same as developed market returns. Third, 
there is a very wide divergence, 20% or more, of the performance between the top and bottom quartile of fund managers. And fourth, we can use VAA to get an idea of how value is created in private equity investments. Put together, all this makes for an exciting but complicated asset class, but it, will, it, it is and will remain forever difficult to measure.